Okay, so good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to to tonight's uh, book launch uh, event. Uh, my name is Gabor Schering. I'm an assistant professor of comparative politics here at Georgetown University. Uh, in my previous life, I was a social organizer and, and a politician working on uh, social justice issues, including the basic income. So that's why I guess uh, Carl uh, asked me to, to moderate this, this event today, tonight. And it's really an absolute pleasure uh, for me to, to be doing this uh, here. Uh, as we are launching Carl Widerquist's book, The Problem of Property, Taking the Freedom of Non-Owners Seriously. Uh, I think most of you know uh, Carl, uh, but to briefly introduce him, he is a professor of uh, political philosophy here at Georgetown University, Qatar. And he is an extremely prolific uh, interdisciplinary researcher and writer. I think I've counted uh, nine books of his uh, so far, with one or two others uh, forthcoming. Um, and he's publishing in the fields of economics, politics, philosophy, and even anthropology. Perhaps he's best known as uh, the leader of the worldwide basic income movement. He is one of the co-founders of the US basic income Guarantee Network, and until 2017, he has been the, the co-chair of the Basic Income Earth Network. But uh, Karl Weiderquist really is more than a basic income theorist. Most of his works uh, revolve around developing what he calls independentarian political theory, which is, in a, in a nutshell, about uh, how we can establish a society that provides a substantively equal freedom for all. Uh, so tonight, Carl is going to introduce his book in around uh, 30 minutes. Then we will we'll have another uh, 30 minutes or so for questions and answers, followed by a reception outside. Thank you very much again for all of you for being here. And now the floor is yours, Carl. The, the, the the book um, starts up with, an, with the name The Problem of Property, um, and the, it, which raises the obvious question, well, what is the, the, what is the problem of property? And that, there's a hint to that in the subtitle of the book, which is Taking the Freedom of Non-Owners Seriously. Uh, property is very often portrayed as something that is essential to freedom, that enhances your freedom, that, uh, uh, that is a natural right and something. Um, uh, but people who portray property in this way usually ignore, they usually focus on what it does for the property owner. It ignores what it does for the people who don't own property. Uh, and uh, they will suggest, well, we all own property in ourselves. Well, uh, that's that's true, but owning property in yourself, um, owning property in yourself is not very valuable if you don't own the stuff that keeps you alive and safe and thriving, um, as most of us don't, and putting most of us in a position where then we have to go to someone who does control the resources of which we can make our food and shelter and clothing, um, and go to them and ask for a job and, uh, or, or for charity or something into what can I do for you to get you to, uh, what can I do to, for you to get you to let me have some access to the things I need to survive. And in, uh, in one of my earlier books, I look into that question uh, uh, quite a bit in depth in Independence, Propertylessness, Propertylessness and Basic Income, A Theory of Freedom is the Power to Say No. I outline what I call the Independentarian Theory of, of uh, freedom, which is a theory of status freedom, a theory of what it means to have the status of a free person. We have a lot of theories about what it means to have more or less freedom, uh, but fewer theories about how do, you, how do you distinguish an oppressed person from a free person. And uh, I argue that the person has to have what I call effective control self-ownership or the power to say no to anybody who would want to control them. Uh, so, in other earlier books of mine, I have um, I've addressed uh, I've addressed some of these issues about 
about, um, about property rights. Um, there is one justification that people often stress with, with not only to justifi justify property rights, but to justify the state uh, in general, is, uh, is what we often call the Lockean proviso, the idea that, oh, well, if you're better off in a system that has property rights than you would be um, in, in uh, a system where there are no property rights and all land is in common, um, then the property rights system is justified, that Hobbes puts it, Hobbes puts it another way, that's sort of the lock, lock in, lock applies it to property rights, Hobbes applies it to the state and says, well, if there's a, uh, if there's a state, you would agree to it if it makes you better off than you would if there was no state, which would be a state of nature, which in life there would be uh, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So of course you'd agree to the state, the state is justified. Locke only says the absence of the property rights would be poor, not all of those other things. I address those claims uh, with Grant McCall. We address those in the prehistory of private property, where we look at how so many of the arguments for the state and the property rights system are based on that claim. Um, and, sh and then we look at the anthropological evidence to show that it's false. People in stateless societies with common property don't necessarily live well, but they very often live better off than the least advantage among us. The people who are living in tents in San Francisco, the people who are working in sweatshops in Indonesia, the people who are living in shanty towns in Sao Paulo, um, are really, are, are, are really, we cannot say that they're better off. And it's, it's really the residual of a colonial prejudice that says, oh, well, every civilized man must be better off than all those naked savages. Well, um, that, that colonial prejudice is alive and well. Then um, in, uh, in our, our next book, um, the pre, pre um, oh, that was, oh, sorry. Uh, held them up in the wrong order. This is actually the one I was talking about before. The prehistory of private property. Uh, in the prehistory of private property, Grant McCall and I address other claims that inequality is natural and inevitable, and anthropological evidence shows that there are societies that are much more equal than people who say inequality is natural and inevitable want to want to want to profess. Um, we we uh, we address the. Uh, the argument that, that um, freedom is, is more consistent with capitalism than anything else, that actually capitalism has some problems that, we, that I talk about in this next book. Uh, and we, uh, um, we address the argument that private property has is something natural about private property. And that's most of the history part of the book, where we look at the history of how property rights develop, the private property system that we're all so familiar with, and we're told, and we've been told, at least since John Locke, that this is a natural system that um, would always exist unless government interferes with it. It's actually very much the opposite, is that you do not get a private property rights system does not has not developed anywhere without governments forcing it on people who had already been sharing the land uh, and using very different sorts of systems. So that brings me to the book that we're talking about tonight, which is part of my effort to develop this big unified theorem. In those, those two books with Grant McCall, I'm looking at problems of natural rights theory and social contract theory. Um, and in this book, written on my own, um, as well as in the, in the first book, I'm building up my own theory. The theory is called Justice as the Pursuit of Accord. And the, uh, uh, the political program that you can get out of it, ideology if you'd prefer to call it that, I call independentarianism because it stresses so much the importance of the, of the independence of each individual. Um, and so in the problem of property, um, I, I look at the question of, of this balance of the freedom, uh, the, the, the freedom enhancing effects that property has for owners, which it does, which are real and, and, and important, but the freedom uh, inhibiting effects and the freedom in the very most, in the very most liberal negative sense of freedom um, that 
the way property can inhibit the freedom of people who do not have a sufficient amount of property. Um, and, and an effort to balance this without, with taking seriously the, 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 the problem that we are, that this has to be a balance. And that you can't just say this person has some natural right to own this thing. So um, I first, so I, 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 I bring up the issue of what is a special right and what is a privilege and what is the difference. Um, special right is something like, uh, like what uh, a husband and wife will have with each other. They have special rights to uh, special rights with each other because they have chosen to form this union. Uh, but a special right could also be something that would occur between uh, between uh, 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 a debtor and a lender. Uh, a lender might have a special right that this person give them money. Uh, because they gave that person money in the past. Might depend on some of the circumstances in which that loan was taken out, but the lender has m certainly more claim to money from the borrower than just another random person. Um, so um, those things at least are possibly construed as special rights, um, but a legal privilege is something that, and a special right can flow from, a special right can also flow from something that applies to everyone. If we are all, if we are all, um, uh, say, uh, we give a reward for anyone who chooses to do this, and every, everybody has the opportunity to do this, and some people choose to do it, they get the reward, that's a special right. Um, but a legal privilege is something that simply by law gives a person an arbitrary advantage over other people for something that, that they, can't, they can't claim any, that can, cannot claim that follows from deeper underlying, deeper underlying uh, equality. It might follow from a deeper equality that the most, most talented person should get the job or something like that, but property doesn't necessarily work that way. So if, um, I looked at the Lockean argument for, the Lockean argument for private property. John Locke, um, even though he lived more than 300 years ago, his argument for property is, has been the basis of so many of the arguments for property ever since that I begin with his menu. I look at the, the problem with Locke is he was a bit vague on what he was saying and philosophers greatly differ about what he was trying to say. There have been so, if you read the literature on what exactly was Locke trying to say when he justified private property, uh, you get wide differences in what they interpret Locke as saying. And what I argue in this section is that is that you, we're never going to find the answer. Nobody is ever going to come up with the interpretation of Locke, and everybody's going to say, aha, this is what Locke was saying, is what we have is these vague ideas that have been filled in by his interpreters and the people who are trying to extend his work. And what we got to do is look at the entire menu of options. And you get an options. Well, um, it, property comes into existence because people appropriate property. And what do they do to appropriate property? Well, they might be the first one to use it, or they're the first one to, they're the first one to uh, enhance its value by working with it, or they're the first ones to claim it, or they're the persons who discover it. You got all these options of what they can do. Um, and then you have um, the stipulation that Locke has. Is he has a Lockean proviso. You can take property, but you have to leave enough and is good for everyone else. Um, there's controversy of whether he even, meant, he even meant that as a proviso. But that has been discussed in many different ways. And it's often been put forward to say, well, the proviso is fulfilled if there are enough good jobs for people to take those. To, to, uh, and those jobs prove to be as good as people would be in a state of nature. Well, we addressed that claim in our earlier book. Um, so we go through, so I go through in the book and I look at uh, specifically different Lockean, uh, different Lockean arguments for private property and um, 
find them all, find them all rather wanting. They, they end up never being able to say that property is more than a, than a legal privilege. Um, you, have, uh, you have original appropriation is not factually true. It doesn't work as a metaphor. The proviso is unfulfilled. And even if you did fulfill a proviso, so you had a bunch of people working at a, at a low level and other people owning fantastic amounts of property, you have not created a system that has basic equality before the law when some people start out with so much. Other people start at a low level, and the people at the low level have to work for the people at the high level. Uh, so um, I find all of these arguments from, from, from more Lockean to more contemporary so-called libertarian or right libertarian or propertarian arguments wanting. And I spend the last part of the book building up my alternative theory of property rights. Uh, with the idea that we can't just simply have an imaginary social contract and say, oh, everybody would agree to this if we did it in the right circumstances. And even though you're the bottom of the totem pole, it's OK, because you would have agreed to this if, if, if we'd started in whatever the right circumstances are. A social contract theory is not a good argument for putting somebody at serious disadvantages of, over, of other people, which I argue more thoroughly in other places. And, I, and, um, and if, the natural, if the natural rights argument for doesn't work, what, what will work? What brings you to this, this more literal, a more literal contract than an imaginary social contract, where you imagine what you would have agreed to? Well, in ideal theory, we can imagine if everybody agreed. Say, we, well, we have, we have an entire world of resources out there, and there are several obvious things we could do to them that do reflect, do with the world of resources, that do reflect equality before the law. One is that we could hold them in common and say, no one can ever own the land, no one can own the seas, no one can own the rivers, but you can all go out and use them. Um, and actually, that's the way most humans treated, mo treated the land as far as we can glean from uh, anthropology for most of human history. For the last 300,000 years that humans have been on the planet, most of that time, most of the land, if not all of it, was treated as a commons. So if there is a default position, that should be it. But I'm not sure there should be a default position. That's one thing that does reflect equality before the law. Um, but another one would be another one would be to use it all for public purposes, to centralize all the property and have it have it run top down as we run the post office or something like that. That um, if it was done if it was done for if it was done and, and if everybody wanted to do that and everybody participated in the decision making and was happy with the decision making, we could do that. We can also divide the resources of the earth equally. That would reflect, that would reflect basic equality of the people. Um, but we might not be happy with all of those solutions. Um, the uh, centralizing all of it might work well in, might work well in an ideal theory, but might not work so well in practice um, if one faction is able to dominate the control of those resources and, and use them. The commons worked well when we had, uh, when we had many fewer people on the earth, um, but it's not likely to work as well if we want to maintain this kind of population and the kind of technology we have. We, but some of the earth really does need to remain a commons. And probably we've privatized too much of it. We need common waterways. We need a common, we need common wild areas that are enough to sustain the environment that keeps us alive. Um, so we do need some in commons, and we might need some for public, we, we certainly need some for public purposes. We need some for education and infrastructure and, uh, and, uh, thoroughfares and things like that. Um, but we privatize, if we privatize resources, it might not 
be the most desirable to privatize them in exactly equal amounts. Because we might like to trade them, and trading them is very much uh, likely to lead to inequalities. Um, and, uh, but leading, that, leading to inequalities, um, leading to inequalities, which would, in a sense, follow from people's agreement, but it's usually the, the agreement of an earlier generation, or the agreement of a past self who made bad decisions that, uh, that uh, you don't feel bound to now. So, what I, so it is possible, though, to, re to privatize resources in an unequal way if those who are going to have more agree to compensate those who are going to have less. Um, somebody might be very skilled and ambitious and might want to uh, do a lot of useful work that would, uh, that would benefit everyone and might want to do that in exchange for a larger share of property. Um, and everyone else might agree. I'm happy for you to have a larger share if you're going to do some work for me that makes the smaller share that I get more valuable. So in an ideal theory, we would all get together and all, we'd all agree this amount for public purposes, this amount for for this amount in, in commons, and this amount privatized, uh, privatized on whatever conditions we agree to, we might, uh, we might not want to privatize any land um, on the condition that the owner is free to uh, dump nuclear waste on that land. Um, but we might say, oh, we're privatizing this land, and you can't pollute it with nuclear waste, and you can't do, uh, you can't do other polluting or annoying things that will bother your neighbors on it. Uh, under, under whatever conditions we want, we, we would all agree to all of these things, and we would agree to a level of compensation that, uh, that the, those who had less were willing to accept from those who have more. That would be an ideal property rights accord. But there are three barriers to a property rights accord. One is overlapping generations, uh, is that you, uh, you have people, people die and people are born and then people would be born not having signed on to those ideas. Another is the improbability of unanimity. It is really improbable to get more than a very small group to agree to, uh, uh, to, agree to any sort of a unanimous decision that is so complex as this one. We might all be able to agree to some what is equal to vision, but once you're saying, well, what kind of compensation, what kind of privatization rules, what kind of things do you want, we're unlikely to have uni unanimity. And then there's the desire of revocability. Um, one of the problems that I have with social contract theory is they said, well, you would have agreed to this, uh, you would have agreed to this before you were born. So well, I don't agree to it now. Um, very often, there, there is, no natural rule that says what you agreed to 20 years ago or 30 years ago or whenever or, um, is something that you must be bound by now. It could be that, uh, that your having once signed your name to an agreement overrides all other ethical concerns. Actually, maybe you were cheated uh, before. Maybe somebody took advantage of your lack of information or your lack of, uh, uh, your lack of foresight. Um, so that leads me then to moving into non-ideal theory of a system where, where, where we attempt to approximate a property rights accord by, by having a democratic system decide what lands are going to be privatized and on what terms. What terms including what sort of regulations about how you can use that land and what sort of a tax you will pay for the privilege of holding that land. Uh, if, and try to get as many people as possible to sign on and saying these are the rules of privatization with the knowledge that we are not going to have unanimity. Now unanimity 
uh, the problem when you have people who are outside of the agreement, uh, the, one of the things that I talk about in the earlier iterations of justice as property accord in my, my, in my first book is that, is that the accord should strive to minimize the negative interference with people who cannot be brought into accord. They're, um, they're very likely to be people who are, who are feeling disadvantaged by the system. The system rewards the, system rewards the, the strong and the weak. The, the, the system rewards the strong or the people who have past advantages or people who have, um, people who have lucky backgrounds. Um, and, and it privatizes too much. It privatizes too much of our natural world, it, uh, or it doesn't have enough public lands, or something like that. So what we so we argue that is for the highest that uh, for, that the compensation first of all has to be enough to maintain everybody's independence, so that we're not forcing everyone to participate. We're inviting people to participate. It has to be high enough to be that amount. And above and beyond that, it should be the highest sustainable level of compensation, given the, our method of privatization, the highest sustainable level of compensation. Uh, and we do this, we do this, uh, so then the compensation then is doing dual duty. One is to get, the, to get as many of the people who have less as possible to agree, to agree to the system. I'm at the bottom of the system but I'm being paid by the people who are at the top. Many people get that compensation and agree to it. There are other people who are like, I am at the bottom of the system. I do not agree to it. Um, and I'm getting this same compensation as everybody else as my compensation that we had to force some kind of system on everybody because unanimity is impossible. And this is your compensation, our way of saying we are trying to have as little negative interference with you as we can. So we, uh, by, by having to choose some sort of system, when we know that no system, except for one that we all were universally and continuously and always in agreement with, in a true accord, since we don't have that, we compensate you. We compensate some to get their agreement, and others we compensate because we cannot get their agreement and we want to harm them as little as possible. We try to get the majority in agreement and compensate the minorities as much as possible. The minority in the sense of the people who, who dissent from the agreement we have. Uh, but uh, on the other side of this, the, the only way that the agreement of property owners comes into this really at all is that the property owner has a decision, well, am I going to live off that basic income, that level of compensation that I'm getting? from everybody else? Or am I going to actually do the, things, do the things that are going to make me a property owner and get me ahead and, and all those things? Am I willing to pay the taxes and follow the regulations that are, that are created by the system as it tries to create a property rights accord? And if I'm, uh, if I'm willing to do that, then I, I work, I get ahead, I start my business or whatever it is that I do, and I pay those taxes, I agree. If I don't, my option is I can say the system is unjust, I don't like the way it's working, I'm going to live off that compensation. Uh, and of course, we have to have other protections for property owners being things like we can't simply single out property owners uh, because of, of, of something that doesn't accord with basic freedom and equality, um, and equality before the law. We can't say, well, uh, this land is regulated, so uh, we can only have Methodist churches. We can't have Episcopalian churches. Um, uh, we can't we can't favor any type of use that doesn't substantively, substantively affect other people. We can say you can you can have you can only have uses that that um, that aren't too noisy to bother other people, but, and you can't have things that are going to harm the environment to bother other people, but you, uh, we cannot regulate what you're going to do that doesn't substantively affect other people um, in, in a way that really interferes with them living in a, in a similar way. That, and is what I say, is an approximation of a property rights accord, and I put that forward as the, the best we can do 
uh, the best we can do as far as as far as coming up with a system that truly that truly reflects that truly reflects uh, the input of everyone and um, trying to protect everyone from everyone from oppression and from being treated as less than an equal before the law. Um, and I, then I, I, I finish by dealing with some replies to objections. I look at left libertarian objections and right libertarian objections and some other things. Uh, and uh, that is what I spell out in the book. And so uh, now I'm ready to go to questions. I think we have a half hour from now for questions, right? So I just grab this microphone. So if you have any questions, now is the time Obviously, to... We don't need a microphone for us to hear each other, but it's for the recording. Exactly. Uh, I think you were the first, Jamie. So I... I you lay out the problem, yeah. and the problem, and the focus on a solution is to continue to focus on property. So my question is, why should we focus on property as opposed to, say, focusing on public goods more generally, or say, focus on capabilities, you know, the capabilities approach uh, in political philosophy or something like that? Why shouldn't the, why should, right, so, so instead of saying, okay, like, here's, here's some amount of property or some amount of compensation mm -hmm. that you're getting for being at the bottom, even if, you, you know, you do dissent from, from the system, why, why not put it into, or, or put the effort into building a system that simply ensures uh, other freedoms mm -hmm. in, in society? Yeah, well, uh, the, uh, I, I'm sort of on the, you know, uh, this is my, my fourth book in trying to lay out uh, justice as the pursuit of accord, but it's not meant to be my last book or the word of all there is to it. So the, the very first book, the very first book was what is the, the justice of pursuit theory of, uh, the justice of pursuit of accord theory of freedom. Um, and that's all it was about was freedom. And then we had two books attacking opponents, and then we had this book with the, uh, with the JPA theory of property. Uh, but it's not, to mention, it's not to meant to outlay the entire uh, theory of justice as the pursuit of a court. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of other things to work out with that. And so the, uh, the, I, the I, uh, so it has implications for even things like, like criminal justice, like, uh, uh, like education, uh, and, and uh, many other, other uh, aspects of humans uh, humans before the law and in front of the rest of society. So all of those things I think are all of those things I think are important. But this book just focuses on the property issue. But I do uh, intend to write it. And my next book is supposed to be called Justice as a Pursuit of Accord. My next book, or the one after that, I intend to write a book with that title, which will probably be quite a bit thicker than this one. Good evening. Uh, my name is Deepak. I specialize in international relations. Uh, so my question is, how much role or influence does ideology, political ideology, play a role uh, in case of redistribution? Now, I ask this question in the context of India, like the land reforms in India in the post-independence era. Not sure whether the example is exactly correct, but land reforms in India have been a huge controversial issue, a massive uh, revolutionary step, in fact. But it succeeded in only uh, two states. And mm -hmm. both these states, state governments, were ruled by communist governments then. Mm -hmm. And I won't say that ideology is the only factor, but ideology did play a huge factor in uh, these two states being successful. And that impact lasts even today. The states are West Bengal and Kerala. Mm -hmm. These are the only two states in which land reforms have been successful. Essentially, redistributing land from the feudal landlords to the tiller. In fact, the slogan itself had been land to the tiller. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to know your thoughts on this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, um, yeah, I've just been reading about how uh, the feudal landlords, it was the British who gave the feudal landlords the, the decided all of a sudden one day, your property owners 
uh, and these other people who've been working this land for generations and generations are not uh, I have no actual rights in them, they're just your tenants, feel free to kick them off, which is the same thing they did back in the UK. Um, so, uh, the, the, I, the, the role of ideologies in, is really central to justice as pursuit of accord because it's, it is, it is a reply, it's, it, is, it is a reply to, it, in, a, in a rejection of the many political theories that think we can get beyond ideology. Um, John Rawls is so overly optimistic that, it was like, well, overly optimistic that underneath all of our ideological differences are these core principles that we all can or will or should agree on if we were reasonable. And so uh, it just, and, and, that, and um, a lot of natural rights theorists can say, well, if your ideology doesn't respect what we call natural rights, well, your ideology is basically criminal. Um, but, uh, so the only barriers that Rawls deals with are uh, uh, then, uh, are, uh, in, from, from what would might sound like an ideological sense, are, are, are barriers of people being unreasonable. Um, and I, I am not so optimistic. So it is, so I'm putting forth a theory that I think makes a lot more modest assumptions that one of the reasons we agree is not just because, because we have different ideas of what it means to live a good life, but we have different basic ideas of what is right and wrong. Um, and I can't just say, well, I figured out what's right, it's this system of natural rights, or I figured out what's right, it's this social contract that I say if you don't agree with it, you're just unreasonable. But um, we have all these ideological differences that make us different, not just about what it means to live a good life, but actually what is right and wrong. And so people have, so the idea is people of different ideologies to come together, to come together and try to come up with an accord. But being aware that we never have everyone in accord. It's not a true accord unless it's unanimous. And it's not, it's, and it's, it's not a true accord, not only if it's unanimous across people, but also across time. If you remain in agreement, you were in accord. If you used to agree, uh, you moved to agree and now don't agree, you might, be, you might be contracted, but you're not in accord. And so I'm trying to dealing with, deal with the, the shortcomings of political philosophy caused by these big ideological differences. Um, but now, how that, how that relates to specific strategies is, is a question that I'm, I'm not sure about. I, I, I know that there's, there's great variation in, in, uh, in which ideolo ideologies are popular in which parts of India. Um, and uh, I, there are times when it might be appropriate to, there, there are times when it might be appropriate to deal with inequality by, 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 physically, by physically reforming land, by saying, you know, look, we're, we're cutting the size of your state into smaller pieces and other people are getting pieces. Or it might be, in some cases, it might be uh, that we're going to leave you in control of this big estate or this big company you own, but we're going to tax it more, and we're going to regulate it more, and we're going to we'll give people cash compensation. Cash compensation and land compensation are both completely legitimate under this, and has to be done on a it has to be done on a case by case, society by society basis, based on what people really think is going to work. Um, so, uh, so very much of this is left to the legislative phrase. What I'm trying to give as a big outline is this you can't do to the least advantage. If you're not compensating them, and you're not compensating them enough that they can thrive and don't have to go and say, yes, sir, may I, may I can please do something for you, sir, so I can keep alive till tomorrow, sir. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing that, you're right. We got, we've got to do it under these outlines. But there's many different strategies that can do that.
Hello. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank, thank you very you much. For, yes, you too. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you for reminding me of what the Locke Proviso was <laughs> and why I think uh, John Locke was absolutely wrong in that and how that justified like the disownership of, of like Native Americans mm -hmm. uh, when the colonizers came in mm -hmm. from Europe. But I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I want to bring in like the environment uh, into this issue. Right? We all heard about the uh, tragedy of the commons, mm -hmm. where, in the, you know, where one thing is held in common and ever, eventually it runs out to the detriment of like, the entire community mm -hmm. or the whole. Right? So in this like, contractual like, property rights accord, right, how, does the, how do you situate the environment into that? How do you tell the actors who are involved in this, in this property accord to be much more conscious of the environment that they're in, that there are limited resources, that they may not take into account the negative externalities of their action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that has to be by law, by enforceable law. And people have to, uh, people need to understand environmental regulations not as government interference with some natural right of private property. There is no natural right of private property. There's, a, there's, there's just me, you, and our differing ideologies and our, and, and, and our belief that we've got to have some way to, we've got to find out some way we're going to use this earth that's fair to everybody. Um, and if we're going to have, ch if, uh, um, and that has to include a healthy environment. Um, we, for, for so many years, were able to get away with thinking that we are so small and compared to this big earth that we can ignore this. And that is no longer possible. And it w hasn't been for a long time. We've got we've to realize that. So, so, um, so one of the conditions that, and people can impose any conditions we want on the private, when you realize private property is not a natural right, it could be a commons, it could be public, it could be split equally, um, but unequal private property is certainly not a natural right. Um, that we are choosing to make an agreement with you, the person who wants to own big property. We're going to put the conditions on that, just as a, as a, as a landlord would. A landlord would can say, you know, uh, you can live in my apartment as long as you, you don't paint the walls and you don't break anything. Um, well, if the, if uh, we're acting here as an ultimate landlord, we can put we can put any environmental regulations we want as a condition of privatization. That is what you're, you're paying for when you buy this property. You're buying, you're buying not complete full ownership of this property, but you're buying a regulated, you're buying a regulated use of this property. And if you don't, if, if you don't, if you object to those regulations, you're free not to buy it. So it, it is in no way an interference with your freedom that we put environmental regulations on the resources of the earth that we let one person control. So thanks, guys, for a very nice uh, talk. So my question goes in the same direction. So uh, I was wondering, so property means also uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe if you have not that much money about getting a property, I think it's a very good idea. But uh, what about the responsibility if you have, for example, to change the heating system because of the greenhouse effect or some things? You have to spend a lot of money again mm -hmm. if you are then in the responsibility. So that's one question. So how do you deal with this situation? Who is uh, renovating then uh, maybe the property if you don't have the possibility? The other question I have, it's a completely different one, uh, that in the communist bloc, they actually had the same idea, yeah? uh, keeping the rent uh, extremely low. You pay mm -hmm. just maybe 5% of your salary. And, uh, but even this was not working, finally. Mm -hmm. so. Well, um, in the communist bloc, uh, the communists talked a really good game about uh, what was wrong with, with capitalism. And, and, uh, uh, and um, I think, uh, although I think the parts of like Marx that he thought were most important were not the parts were most important. He thought the most important thing was that the system was going to collapse. Well, it hasn't collapsed yet. Um, and he thought, uh, it seemed to me, he thought the second most important thing was that um, you can calculate a rate of exploitation and, and uh, um, your employer gets a certain percent of what naturally should be your salary. I don't think that's what's important. Uh, what is important, I think, 
uh, which which he gave is a, is is what he puts at uh, well two things this idea of alienation of how this how this consumer based society doesn't really make us happy that I think is hugely important and the other one is when he says that the proletariat has nothing uh, has nothing to sell but the, their labor which I take to mean that the proletariat which is the vast majority of us has no other choice but to sell their labor or they're going to they're going to be living on a street and and eating out of other people's dumpsters um, and that this system was created by elite and this system was created by an elite and it is for the benefit of the elite but what most of most of the Eastern Bloc, well, all of the Eastern Bloc countries did, um, was to set up a new elite system where they did not, they did not really put workers in control of the factories. Um, uh, they put, they, they put a new form of elite in control of the factories. Um, they, um, and uh, they did not relieve the proletarian condition by freeing the workers from having to go to someone else in order to say, please, sir, may I work for you in order to keep myself alive. They left the proletariat in that condition. They said, oh, well, once, uh, once uh, the, it's not a capitalist you have to work for, then it's no problem that you're forced to work. Well, actually, it was a big problem. They couldn't do. And keeping rents low, I actually think, was a, was, was a bad mis w w was a mistake because it didn't, it, didn't, uh, it didn't help to equate cost with benefits. Um, what I'm actually advocating is, is, is higher rents, is higher rents, but compensating people for that so that, so that the average person can, they're getting that money from the people who are buying the most valuable real estate and can use that, um, and can use that for, um, can use that to be able to afford the rents that we're paying. Um, now, the other part of the question, I guess I didn't really understand that one well enough to give a good answer. So we, we can talk about that in the reception. Um, I was curious about something you didn't touch upon, maybe yeah. you do in the book. So when you outline the ideal theory in which some land is mm -hmm. set aside for privatization mm -hmm. and that's puzzled yeah. out according to what people agree to, one of the problems you mentioned is that it's hard to get unanimous agreement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, isn't there a more basic problem there that even if you were to get unanimous agreement, how do you assess the worth or the value of the agreement? Doesn't there need to be some other kind of underlying standard? And I say this because um, there are cultures and religious traditions in which what people think is a, a, a suitable compensation is already affected by various social structures. So a woman might just uh, think that, yeah, I mean, I will agree to you, know, to you taking this, this share as long as you give me this much, but what she asked for might be less than what a man asked for and, and so on, right? So, um, so because of prior existing cultural or religious beliefs, uh, what people agree to uh, need not in any sense be um, uh, create a justice, uh, you know, by accord and so on. So I was wondering, isn't, doesn't there need to be something, some other independent underlying standard, even if you were to get unanimous agreement? Yeah. Um, that that has to do that that has to do with a lot of things i mean the 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 main way i'm i'm treating that is that that that's an that's an excellent uh, uh, that's an excellent argument for for one of the provisions of justice the pursuit of the court and that is the desirability of revocability um that that you might, for all these reasons you laid out, you might agree to something that you really shouldn't have agreed to. Um, and if you ever come to realize that, um, uh, it's people looking back and saying, well, you agreed to it is a very bad reason for them to say we, we have to. Now, that is, uh, but that is, I think, uh, despite the fact that what you give is really good argument for that, um, that is certainly revocability is something you need in, in response to this, but it's probably not all that you would need in response to this. Um, the, um, the, and so, and, and because it, it sort of assumes, to give you to say, okay, we're gonna rely 
totally unrevocability to deal with the problems that you just brought up. If we did that, it, is, it, it amounts to saying, um, it amounts to saying that, yes, you could agree, you could agree to things, all, all kinds of things that you didn't agree to, but um, because of, of cultural issues and things like that, but ultimately it is only up to you to change your mind and object to that. Um, and it puts, and it says, well, to, to some other person who might be saying, well, a lot of these people agree to, to things that seriously disadvantage them, that they can't force it on you. Um, and to some extent, that is, that, um, that there's good reasons, there's some good reasons to do that because, uh, because um, it, it fights cultural imperialism and it, and it fights uh, some top-down understanding and say, well, it's very easy to say to anybody, you, you shouldn't have agreed to this, I know what you should agree to. Um, it prevents those things, but it also, but it still might not be an unsatisfactory answer because, well, okay, yeah, you, you do have a danger in people doing this too much, but you also have this danger that this could go on forever without this person ever in, invoking their right of revocability. Um, and so, one, well, one of the issues that I, I, I would say in response to that is there is no perfect solution. That's why the justice is always in the pursuit of accord, but we're always pursuing justice. So many theories of, 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 of political philosophy or of, of, of justice are always like, well, once you put my theory in, my set of natural rights or my version of the social contract, put that in and we've solved the problem and uh, anybody that doesn't agree is, is unreasonable or, or a criminal or something like that. Um, so one thing is I don't think we're ever going to get a perfect solution to problems like that. But I also do think that I, it, this, this book doesn't spell out enough solutions to that. Because with the idea of justice in the pursuit of accord is supposed to do is to be, is to be not starting from an imaginary starting point, but starting from where we are now which we know embodies a lot of past injustices, and try to take all the legal privileges out of the system. If one, if one of those legal systems is, um, is a cultural system that tells this group to defer to that group and defer and give and give all the time, that is one of those problems. And we need things like, uh, we, we need things like, like, uh, like education and open-mindedness and, try, and to, to try to fight those, those, those sort of things and try to create, uh, tr try to create a more open and, and biased dialogue. And it's, it's not going to be easy because you've got these, these uh, all these twin dangers of cultural imperialism versus, uh, versus letting people accept, uh, letting people accept uh, uh, except oppression, and, and there, is, there will never be a perfect solution, but it is something that we, that I, I agree that revocability is not the only thing that is not the only solution to that problem. We've got to do more. Um, if I could just push this issue a little bit more. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I don't need to tell you about the yeah. Marxian theory of false consciousness, but yeah. um, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I won't. Um, but, but I, you know, I, I, I think that the, the, the point that, that Anjana raises is, is actually a serious point. And, you know, to tie back mm -hmm. to, you know, something that, that, that Jamie said earlier, you know, he mentioned, for example, the like Nussbaum's, uh, uh, you know, uh, capabilities approach. You know, it, it, re it really does seem, you know, intuitively that, uh, you know, a theory of justice needs to be anchored in some substantive conception of the good. Uh, otherwise, you do have this problem of, of false consciousness. You have this problem of, you know, Nussbaum talks a, a lot about, you know, Nussbaum and Sin talk a lot about, you know, one of the problems of taking people's sort of desires and preferences as the starting point for your, for your conception of human flourishing is this problem of adaptive preferences. You know, in Women and Human Development, Martha Nussbaum talks a lot about, uh, you know, women, for example, who don't want an education or mm -hmm. they don't want this or that or the other because they've been basically, uh, you know, 
because the, th this seems like such an unrealistic desire for them that they just, they, they mm -hmm. basically, their desire for such things has been extinguished, right? And so, uh, you know, this, this I, I agree with you that, that revocability is not enough because, you know, the, the kind of, the, the women whom Nussbaum interviews in her book and whom, you know, she talks about, they're never going to want an education. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just pie in the sky thinking for them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, that's never going to, but you know, if, 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 if your only tool for, for moving toward justice is this sort of accord or agreement, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's not anchored by some sort of external, this is why, you know, this objective notion of human flourishing is so important for someone like Nussbaum, because it gives you this mm -hmm. sort of objective, you know, point to, to use as, as a, you know, somewhere to pull from. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're when you're looking for an object uh, a theory of justice, and uh, I guess that I just I just worry that without that, if if all you have is agreement, without some sort of you know substantive theory of value that that, that that's doing some some hard work there, that that you're gonna you're not gonna have an answer to the kinds of worries that Anjana is raising. That's the way I want to push you on this. Yeah, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I just So I think part of what, if I understood your response earlier correctly, mm -hmm. I think one thing, and because you mentioned Ms. Brown, right? Um, so for all her feminist credentials, there's a lot of pushback against her from non-Western feminists as well, for the point that Carl was raising, right? So I mean, this was exactly my question. Don't you need some kind of what you call an objective conception of the good? But then the real danger of that is that uh, there is a, a sort of cu cultural imperialism, right? Whichever way you conceive of, and Ms. Bond is the one who set out this list of, uh, but Amartya Sen, who is the, the, you know, the original author of the capability approach, was precisely for this reason always insisted on never saying it. And I think what he said is kind of in line with Carl, right? I mean, you let the community kind of work it out and you kind of give them information and educate and so on. But um, at least the way I understood Carl saying um, is because he's beginning from the issues of the present, uh, right? And, and these twin dangers on either side, one is cultural imperialism and the other is going all the way th to, you know, Marxist false consciousness or the term adaptive preference, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, uh, Possibly, like, I think I agree with him with this uh, call to the extent that this, I don't see a solution myself, right? It's, it's probably a pendulum going to swing this way, that way, somewhere. So maybe that's the sort of response he was intending. Yeah, and I, uh, so our response was saying that, that, um, that it's important to remember what the, the limits and the, the, the modesty of what Justice of pursuit, justice as a pursuit of accord is trying to do, because it's not trying to say this is a substantive theory about this is a substantive theory about uh, everything about how uh, government should be organized and what rights should, should people have before the law and stuff like that. It is a framework for making these decisions, um, and so uh, so it's dealing like it, it's dealing not. Uh, um, it's dealing with like 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 a, a back step from 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 where you're talking about. I'm thinking about suppose suppose we've actually put in this substance of a framework, and we and we do have a majority of people who've signed on to this agreement that disadvantages women because of the reasons you said. A lot of a lot of women agree to it, so it's it's a majority of men and women who are voting for this thing. The um, and it's and it is it is a real majority. Um, so if we wanted to say, well, the laws must be different, it has to, then it then it would have to be we'd have to have an anti-democratic revolution to change it right now. The idea of justice as pursuit of accord is that the is I guess gives us just the hope that there will be some women who say this is harming me. If you want to live this way, you want to live this way. I think you're making a mistake, and I'm going to say, if I'm, I think you're going to make a mistake. I'm going to try you try to talk these other women out of living this way. Uh, but in the mo in the meantime, I under under JPAD, I have the right to live my way. So I have I, I have the right not to accept these things. Um, and and uh, that kind of a framework, I. I think all that is, is the hope that hopefully if you have that kind of a framework and you have that kind of freedom, that things will move in the right direction. 
Um, but uh, because the alternative of an, of an anti-democratic revolution is, is uh, scarier to me. Any other questions? Okay, Jamie. So I'm tempted to continue to talk about the capabilities approach and, and, and how that might you know, intersect with JPA, but I'm actually going to ask a totally different question. Uh, and, and that is, uh, the, the implications, uh, or, or do you see the implications here with regard to sovereignty? Because the biggest property holders, of course, are governments, and the ones that do the most harm with their property vis-a-vis -vis others are, are governments. Uh, so you're, 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 you're granting, or you're trying to work out a notion of property that's uh, not like a libertarian notion of property. That, you know, there's, there's regulations with regard to what property is and the extents and limits, et cetera, of your being a property holder. And uh, do you see implications for that with regard to governments? Oh, yeah. Um, the governments can do stuff that people have reasonable objections to and definitely as much. As, uh, as private holders can. Um, governments devote a lot of things to things that I think are, 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 are enormous mistakes. And those, um, so all the same things would apply. It, it would apply to not just to the, not just to the, the land that's private, privatized. You could object to the, how much land is, how much land or which land is privatized, how much is, how much is, is, um, how much is nationalized and how much is in, in a commons or which particular things are in those categories and what people are being allowed to do. Those. All of that is stuff that, that people can and will dissent from and, and in a lot of cases probably should dissent from. Now, but as far as the capability approach goes, I use the capabilities approach in, in uh, freedom is the power to say no um, to, to come up with, with uh, the idea of what people need in order to live independently. So I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not discarding the capabilities approach.